you're, you know, with the UFC trying to get into the Hispanic market mm -hmm. and you being of, you know, Hispanic descent, uh, have you talked to them or have they talked to you about, you know, fighting in Mexico or anywhere in Latin America or South America to try to take advantage of your, your uh, descent? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would love to fight in Venezuela. I mean, I got a lot of family down there. It would be awesome if they could actually watch me live. Um, but, you know, it's it's up to the UFC. And one of my favorite places to fight, I, I, Rio is one of my lucky cities. I actually fought in the HFC arena and I got my, uh, my world civil battle in, in judo there. And, um, I won the Pan Am Games there. I always do really good in Rio. And so um, I, I've always wanted to fight there. So if I could ever have a fight in, in Brazil, you know, I'd love to. But um, that's kind of what I miss about the judo days is, you know, traveling around. And yeah, I, I miss, you know, I'm a South and Central America, man. It'd be cool to be able to go. I got family in Antigua and Trinidad, too. You know, if you just want to send me <laughs> there. The yeah, you want to send me to a nice little island. I wouldn't complain. Well, I guess, you know, that's a big, you know, that's maybe the one area of the world where the UFC hasn't really made a lot of inroads in, in Latin America, you know, and I know they're trying to use Kane as, as that. And I was just wondering, do you see that you could be influential there? You, I, you don't speak Spanish, do you? Uh, I, it was very difficult for me to learn English. I didn't speak English until I was, like, six. So um, everybody else in my family, uh, you know, speaks Spanish. My, shist my sister Maria was actually a, a journalist in, in Costa Rica and writes fluently in Spanish. And you know, my mom's fluent, and you know, I just I had so many problems early on uh, that they, they focused just on, on English with me. And so um, you know, I would I would love to speak Spanish. I would love to be bilingual, but you know, uh, it, it was a, speech was always a, a struggle for me. And um, I'm, I'm happy I could talk at all, <laughs> but I, I try to learn, but, you know, I, uh, I just, I don't really absorb very well, you know, these guys have been speaking Armenian around me forever, I, I don't know, like, three words, and I, I try, you know, right. it's just, uh, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I should give Rosetta a try or something. <laughs> so much of the focus coming into this fight has been about your quick turnaround and, and your decision to do that. During this process, has there been any regret at all of thinking that, that maybe this wasn't the right call for you? No, I think it's actually better. I, I think it's more of an advantage for me fighting 56 days after my last fight than, you know, Sarah fighting 10 months after hers. I mean, <coughs> if you think about it, this would never happen in boxing. You would never see um, two, two guys fighting for a title with one guy having a 10-month layoff. No promoter would let him do that because they'd be so worried about ringless. They would have him have a tune-up fight first and then fight for the title. And so um, I think it's actually it's more of a problem that she has not fought in so long than I fought so recently because I mean I've looked at uh, me and my coach have looked at all my past performances and I always did had my best sh my best showings when there was a shorter turnaround right and I'm used to doing that in judo too you know I would do the Europe tour and I would have a world cup four weekends in a row right. and the funny thing is I always did the best in the last one yeah even before either one of you was in the UFC, I heard a lot of people that always said, Sarah has the type of stylistic matchup that would be problematic for Ronda. Do you agree with that assessment that, you know, whether or not she can pull it off and execute it, that it's her style, that it's the way that she fights that would be most problematic for your style? Um, well, I don't want to give anything away, but, um, you know, it, everybody presents their own unique problems, and she brings her own unique things to the table. And... Um, People have tried a bunch of different ways to, to approach me and approach a fight, and I always expect that they're going to come out with something different. And so we'll see whatever different ideas that they have, but we pretty much focus on not so much what the other person's weaknesses are, but we focus on what my weaknesses are and do everything that we can to close them for the whole camp. We have the more of the focus is on me and making it, so whichever approach that they have, we, we have an answer to it. Instead of really worrying about how I'm going to catch her, we kind of more, more spend time on um, how I can make myself uncatchable. Yeah. Where do the ping pong balls factor in there? What does that help shore up? Um, it's, a, it's a lot of hand-eye coordination and he purposely throws them up in the lights so I have to look through the lights and catch it uh, which is uh, you know uh, really helpful on, on fight night because you have those bright lights in your eyes and um, it just kind of helps to make you adjust and, and it's fun so I, I think that having fun when you're training is important. Something that uh, I know is you're working now with Shayna Baszler and Jessamine Duke. Uh, did you discuss any of the aspects of Shayna's fight with Sarah McMahon and ahead of your own? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, we, we talked about it with her. I, I was more interested in uh, the personality stuff with uh, McMahon than the actual fight. We could all watch the video, and you know, Shayna can tell us. Can uh, Shayna could tell us her impressions and everything? But um, it's. I think personality matters the most in, in a fight, and so um, that kind of insight that Shana could give me was 
but the, the most helpful, I think. What, kind what of did you dissect? Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to give anything away. Sorry. I guess, can you elaborate on what it means, though, as far as, maybe not specifically to her, but when you say that that personality, is it because you think you can glean how they'll react or how they'll be in certain situations? Well, I mean, why is that so important to you when breaking someone down? Um, yeah, it just uh, tells you what their, their tendencies would be, you know. Um, Sarah is, you know, on paper, she's an amazing athlete, and athletically, you could say that we're, we're very close to equals, and that's why people are, you know, so excited about this fight, but I think that I'm more of a fighter than she is. It's, I can tell that this title is not as important it is to her as it is to me. You know, she has a kid at home, and, and she has to go home to that kid, and I can afford to be selfish where she can't. I'm willing to die in there, and she can't. As far as all these projects that you have coming up, uh, I understand that Warner Brothers has a character that they're creating for you called Athena. Athena Project is something like the Bourne movies. When do you expect to start doing those up? Uh, it wasn't created for me. It's actually a, a book by a best-selling author, Brad Thor. And uh, uh, it doesn't have a writer yet, so it hasn't been put into a screenplay. Uh, they're, they're buying the story in the book. And so that's, since it's, it's such a work in progress, it's really far ahead, you know, it's, it's going to be really long down the line. So I'm definitely going to fight a few more times before that project actually really gets started. And where do you see maybe Kat Zangano coming into that picture, being that she was supposed to be the one that you were going to fight uh, with the tough finale? So uh, have you heard anything about her progress and are you expecting maybe to face her soon? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm cool with Kat, and I think she's, she's an awesome chick, and I really think that she does deserve to fight for the title. And, you know, I've, I've talked to her before and said, you know, we someday are going to have the title fight that you deserve. You know, just get better, get 100%. I want you the best ever. I don't want to, you know, win when you're not when you're not 100% yet. I want us to be able to fight each other at our best and leave no doubt. And so when she feels like that time has come, I'm ready and waiting for her. Come I just got to beat Sarah first, so I'm still here. <laughs> Rhonda, are you at all motivated by records? Like John Jones talked about how motivated he was to be Tito Ortiz's record. Mm -hmm. You know, you, every fight you win is another record to the women's thing. Are, are you, do you have in your mind, I want to set a standard that, you know, years from now people are going to say, I want to beat Ronda Rousey's record, that it would be difficult to beat in terms of title defenses? Um, I mean, I'm, I keep trying to top myself. <laughs> I mean, like, it's hard to, to keep being creative and think of what can I do that's crazier than the last thing. And uh, that's why I'm so excited about this fight with Sarah because, you know, she is, uh, it's an amazing matchup. You know, two undefeated Olympic medalists fighting for a title. And, um, and uh, I don't know, I just have to, I have to get creative to, to create new records, you know. And uh, I think that this actually, this is a record because um, I think I'm tying Matt Hughes with the fastest title fight turnaround in history. It was 56 days, and he actually lost his second one. And so I'm going to be the first one to win two title fights back to back. There you go, record. Speaking of first runner, this is the first time uh, two Olympic medalists have met inside the cage. It wasn't guys, it was you, it was you guys, it was the ladies. Ten years from now, it's looking like this could be the norm, that this is going to be the shift that's going to happen. You're going to see more of that. That said, how much does it mean to you to be the first to do this and to, and to set that mark? Um, it'll mean a lot more to me after I win. You know, I don't really sit and bask and I'm like, oh, what a great piece of history I accomplished today. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't really do that until I'm sitting down in my hotel room eating buffalo wings and I look at my friends and I was like, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's more my, my celebration. <laughs> so, um, yeah, ask me, ask me the day after the fight and um, I'll, I'll share some wings and let you know. I might have, not share. Do you have every intention for Especially fighting? if you're a ranch guy. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a honey mustard guy. What? Uh, no, chunky blue cheese, sorry. Uh, Gotta look. <laughs> you, have, you have every intention for fighting for years to come, or is it just one one fight at a time, one year? Um, it's one fight at a time, I play by year. I mean, I had no idea what I, if you asked me two years ago what I'd be doing today, I would have no clue. I wouldn't, I wouldn't see a lot of this stuff coming, so, you know, um, man's plans are proof that God has a sense of humor. So, I'm just, the more far in the future I plan, the more vague my plans are, so then, you know, it's more likely that they're not going to be off. Yeah. Well, you know, they do always say it's easier to become a champion than it is to stay a champion. I mean, when you have, you know, lucrative movie deals and things like that on the table, does it, like, kind of cut into your motivation a little bit to go to the gym and to put in the hard work that you have to be to compete at this level? No, because there would be no movies or anything like that if it wasn't for me fighting. No one would care if I wasn't doing well as a fighter. 
and um, there's, there's, you know, quite a few UFC champions, and there's quite a few action stars, and there's no both, and I want to be the first one to do that, and a lot of people doubt me, and they say it's impossible, and those are the things that really, really motivate me, is the doubt. Well, people who were doubting you were some of the people when Rashad Evans got hurt saying this pay-per-view is going to be shit. Nobody's going to buy the pay-per-view because, you know, Rashad's off the card and that type of thing. You know, it's like almost a personal challenge to you. And when Dana made the comment last week that he thought you were the biggest star in the UFC and maybe in the company's history, mm -hmm. you know, that, that created a social media uproar. You know, what's your reaction? Do you get competitive on that? Does that bother you when you hear that kind of thing come out? Um, I get concerned. You know, I do have my concerns about this pay-per-view. It's a really quick turnaround, so I really haven't given people a chance to miss me. And there's, it's after two huge pay-per-views, the, the Super Bowl card and the, and the New Year's card. And, um, you know, and, and when I'm the, the headliner, all the pressure really does fall on me to deliver. And, um, uh, and you know, I've had so many fights and so much movies and all this stuff. I, like, it's just, it, I... It wasn't the best for my fight camp to do as much press as I did as the, the Carmouche fight. I really had to cut it down. And I do worry about these things, but it's like the the number one issue in front of me is the fight. The pay-per-view is second, and I have to do what's best for the fight and what's best for me to win. And so, um, you know, I've I've talked to Dana about, you know, whatever concerns that I do have, and he says, like, Look, it's my it's my job to sell pay-per-view. Just worry about winning this fight. And I wonder on that along those lines. I mean, I see a lot of similarities between you and Floyd Mayweather in that you're both great fighters and you're both great salesmen. And you know, you get people interested. I wonder if have, have you ever talked to Floyd or have you studied him at all and tried to take you know any technique that he's used to to try to promote yourself? Uh, my my coach definitely cites uh, Floyd Mayweather all the time, and um, he, he really does believe that he's the best boxer out there right now. And I I agree with him. And um, I was actually kind of sad before that he was so against MMA, but now he's, he's managing MMA fighters, so I'm like, yeah, Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, he is someone that I, I aspire to be very much like in, in a business sense, you know? And um, it's just uh, I can try and take whatever lessons that I, that I can. And uh, my coach definitely uh, tries to throw some just some stylistic uh, uh things my way that he, he also learned from him. We're not going to see a shoulder roll out of you, are we? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, right before the, the Julia Budd fight, I had a, a grade two to three separation of my AC joint and my shoulder, like a couple weeks before I got that, and I had to drop my arm for the whole camp. And so we actually were like trying to, to copy a lot of the voice though, because I could not lift my arm. And um, so, yeah, sometimes it... it I could go more into depth into it, but I don't want to give anything away about how it really links to MMA and grappling and how it's actually really awesome. Um, maybe after the fight I'll tell you. How okay. serious are you about, about the acting side? I mean, uh, you know, we know you're in action movies, but do you ever think about getting more serious about it? I mean, I don't know if we're going to see you at the actor's studio or not. But. Um, well, you know, I, I actually, one of the first times that I met with Stallone, he was telling me that... Um, it's one thing to be an actor, and it's another thing to, to you know, it's one thing to aspire to be an actor, and it's one thing to aspire to be a star. Yeah, and um, if you're aspiring to be an actor, you could be someone like who's someone's like amazing, masterful actor, like you know, like Philip Seymour Hoffman. Was. He's yeah, right amazing. Up. But um, he always played, give you like a different look with yeah. every single every single character that he had. But then uh, you have people like like Al Pacino, who is you know Al Pacino as the gangster, Al Pacino as the cop, Al Pacino as you know the surgeon, and then he was just he played himself in every situation. And he said that um, he told me that the what really make, like gives people that star factor is everyone wants to see you. They want to see you in these different roles. And so I'm just uh, I'm not trying to be the next Meryl Streep or anything like that. You know that takes a, a lifetime of work, and I'm starting behind. And so um, I'm just trying very hard to be myself in every situation in really high pressure situations and I try to be myself when I'm out there fighting. I'm a fighter first. These are all lessons that I took from fighting and if they can transfer over and I could just be myself in other high pressure situations like when there's a bunch of people pointed at me like kind of right now and I have to act normal. I mean that's all that's the best I can do and that's what I'm really aiming for. Win or lose uh, with this fight, how long do you intend to take off in between in the interim? Like, probably not want to get back right away like you did with this fight. Um, uh, Dana gave me a very, a very generous, you know, amount of time that I could take off, but I'm probably not going to take that long. 
you know it, I mean it depends on when I, I when the company needs me and when I really feel like getting back but I mean um, my best hypothesis is probably late summer Speaking on the promotional front and kind of being yourself um, 157 you debut you carry women's MMA into the UFC you play the heroine next fights Tate and you kind of take over the role of the heel so you've played the good girl, so to speak, and the heel. Do you have a role that you perform more? Do you not really think about it that much? Or you just adapt to each situation? I never pretended to be a good girl. I didn't say pretend. I said you were the good girl. Or did I say pretend? You said played. Played, okay. You think I'm playing you right now? <laughs> no comment. Not at all. Okay. Well, um, you know, I, I just try to be myself, and when people want to portray, they'll put it out there. Whatever is best for the fight, whatever Gotham City needs, I'll be. You know, but um, it's You're not... Um, yeah, I'm Batman, and, and you know, everyone else is uh, Scarface. When, the, but when he really was, when he really was the mayor, not Two Face, Two Face. Oh, again. See, I said Scarface once in an interview, and I was like, oh my god, I just, I was just talking about Al Pacino two seconds ago. That's, that's why it leaked over. And I literally walked into the house the other day, and I was like, God damn it, Shayna! I called Two Face Scarface. I'm the biggest idiot. Can you tell us about the Four so, Horsemen? Thank you, thank you for watching. Out. <laughs> tell us about the Four Horsemen. What about them? They're four horsemen or four horsewomen? The women. They're over there. <laughs> That's uh, Arnie Anderson. There's Ollie Anderson. Tully isn't here. And I'm Ric Flair. I'm sorry, but... She was our best. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you trying to feed me lions? Yeah. No. What's no. <laughs> up? Ron, pre previously you sort of acknowledged that uh, the movies and all these other things that come, the other opportunities are mainly due to fighting. That said, do you feel like there's more at stake each time you come out and fight now? Yeah, the stakes are always higher, and that's the situations that I always do the best in, you know. I started judo at the very beginning with the intent that I was going to win the Olympics at it, and I was groomed from the very beginning to perform the best in high-pressure situations. You know, I didn't want to be a dojo fighter, you know, the guy that, you know, was really good in the gym and then, or did really beat good people at tournaments that didn't matter, but when it really counted, they folded. I was always brought up to be the opposite, and so... Um, I, I purposely stack things against my favor to make the odd, the, the uh, stakes higher. Like the last fight, I purposely did the two movies right before to make it harder. I mean, how else could I get people to doubt me that I was going to beat Misha and Hardy beat her before? I had to put, uh, I had to stack, you know, the odds against me in a certain way. And uh, with this fight too, I had to do the quick turnaround. It, it's what makes it more difficult than it seems more impossible. And um, after I beat Sarah, I mean, it'll. Um, it'll be hard to come up and keep being creative and <laughs> thinking of something else to make it even harder. But I'll try. Well, you're watching pro wrestling now. You can do a handicap match. Huh? Do a handicap match, two on one. Uh, uh, good, good luck with athletic commission. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, Rhonda, Commission's okay. When you look, you know, when you were a young girl, you know, swimming was your thing with your dad, and then, you know, judo was the thing with your mom. Is in any way acting sort of your thing of independence this is my thing you know where it doesn't have ties to anybody else it's something you find and you're doing on your own uh no i think mma was more of that okay because when i said i want to do mma all my judo coaches told me i, I was you know they told me to go screw myself and my mom told me it was the stupidest thing she ever fucking heard oh, those were that was her exact line she, she said professional fucking crocheting doesn't exist you know We're like i wouldn't support that either I, not that i don't think you wouldn't be great at it but there's you're not gonna make any money off of crocheting you know and um that was kind of the thing or it was you know very much me versus the world and um i wanted to prove everybody wrong and that's what really made me motivated and made it into my thing you know the uh um acting stuff just kind of really happened organically and um that one's more, you know, me against all the MMA fans that hate me. <laughs> I, I, I've just kind of I've made this imaginary group of people into my villain now. Can I follow up on that one thing? At, at the end of the Olympics, when you got your medal, you were interviewed, and I saw where you said you were asked if you would do MMA, and you weren't sure. And they mentioned Manny and Roman that you know had gone into it, and you weren't sure you were going to do it. What put you over the edge? Like, why did you decide to do it after being undecided at the Olympics? Uh, well. It's funny, before the Olympics, I would secretly already think about it. <laughs> After I saw Gina Carano fight, I would secretly already think about it, and it was too stupid to ever mention, and I would get shot down. I knew if I said anything like it. I remember actually uh, being in Wakefield, Massachusetts, and walking over to Home Depot where I was a cashier, listening to my headphones, thinking about what it would be like to like be an MMA champion, and, and then I was just like, oh, it's, just, it's so stupid. I tried, I tried to 
push it out of my mind. And it was just kept eating in and eating in. And it, it got to the point that um, when it was when I took my year off after the Olympics and I was grappling just for fun. And I was getting really used to doing nogi and actually really liking it. And I was liking it in a way that I, I, I forgot that I enjoyed judo. You know, I, I kind of stopped enjoying judo after a while. And I really found that enjoyment in grappling again. And I think it was also um, me not winning the Olympics. It left me still like I was happy and I got closure and I was satisfied with my judo career but there was still something missing that I hadn't quite made it and that's why I really believe a lot of the worst things in your life come from the best things and that I thought it was the end of the world that I knew you know when I lost the quarterfinals and I knew I wasn't going to win the Olympics that year and I, I knew in the back of my mind I didn't want to go back and now I, I see why and I understand. Because you can I just finish Chris? Because you won a bronze and not a gold, do you display it? Does it mean as much to you? I mean, you know, is it out somewhere where you can see it every day? Oh no, I hide everything in my house. Like, like my medal, I lost my medal like seven times. I really did. I did. I I left it in a bar a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> so right after the Olympics, I was like, I never got to drink. And so I realized, like, hey, people give me free drinks. I'm like, go out with my medal. And oh, my God, there were so many times I woke up in the morning. I was like, where is my medal, guys? <laughs> and uh, a friend of mine actually woke up, like, on an airplane and reached his pocket. He was like, hey, look at that. It's a medal. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. I, it's just stuff. It's, uh... I wouldn't even be upset if I if I lost both if I if I lost both my medal and my UFC belt and I didn't have anything physical there because it's it's just stuff you can get those made you know it's, it's what it stands for that actually means something. So even if it was gold, you wouldn't have cared then. I mean, if it, no. that would, would that it wouldn't have raised a level. If I won Olympic gold medal and I lost it the next day, I'd be like whatever. Like the the gi that I fought in. If I, I was wearing my medal under my uh, under my my clothes when I left the uh, left the arena, and um, thank God I was because my the geese I fought in all my stuff like my 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 podium sweats everything was in the back of some taxi that drove off in China and I never saw it again. <laughs> and I was like, oh look my stuff. Okay, let's eat. You know, like it's just, it's just stuff. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Dave.